All right, I think we'll get started here. So if you are here to talk about trauma-informed education, you're in the right place. <laughs> so welcome, welcome everybody. Um, was anybody here not at my keynote that was just now? I just wanna know if I should like repeat anything or because I'm mostly not gonna go back and repeat stuff if folks were basically all there. <laughs> Um, but I'll just reintroduce myself just in case. Alex, uh, she, her pronouns, I'm in Winooski, Vermont. Um, I am from Lexington, Massachusetts, and so I'm very excited, Cheryl, to see you here. <laughs> um, although you, I don't think you were the coach when my brother was, <laughs> was there. Um, also, I had such a good debate joke I was gonna make in the keynote and I forgot, so you all have to suffer through it. I was going to say, Sometimes in Zooms, I worry that I talk too fast, but I know that you all will be able to keep up. <laughs> I was so proud of myself for that one. I forgot it in the keynote, so my apologies to you all. Um, <laughs> so um, we're going to do our getting ready to learn pieces uh, again because we're in a new learning space. So we're going to take our 30 seconds of a check in with yourself. So just a reminder, I'm going to turn off my camera. I invite you to do the same. There are some suggestions on the screen and I'll call us back together in about 30 seconds. Okay, we'll come back together. And so for our check in, I would love to know on a scale of baby Yoda, how are you doing this afternoon, and you can feel free to just drop a number or you could share with us why. Um, and I will say that I am a uh, I'm like a cross between a four and a five I'm feeling excited to be here and it's like really humid right now. And um, I don't have good airflow in here. And so I'm excited for in an hour, I will go sit in front of my AC unit. All right, I'm seeing lots of twos and threes. Seeing some fours, feeling sleepy, but chugging along, feel that. Oh, going back to school already, Margo. That's, we're all thinking, we're all thinking of you, I think. I always forget that some schools start so early. Growing up in New England, we typically don't get started this early. All right. Thank you folks for checking in. All right. And then my encouragement to everyone is just a reminder to take what you need. So talking about trauma can stir things up. And so make sure to reach out to support networks of yours if you are noticing that stuff gets stirred up. Um, so, so let me uh, frame up a little bit what I hope to do with our hour together. So um, I have a few slides here. Um, I'm hoping we can really have a conversation. I know also that there wasn't like a question time at the end of the keynote. And so um, if you came to this session because there's something in particular that you want to unpack more, or you have a particular question, I'd actually love it if you could drop that in the chat now, um, because I'll go through my stuff, but, um, but if there's something you really wanna focus on, I love a good tangent, and so I'm happy to uh, just sort of go where, where the group wants to go. So uh, let me just pause for a second. If there's particular questions or subtopics from the keynote you're really excited to dig into, go ahead and drop those in the chat. Okay, I see one about bonding activities, get to know you stuff. 
if people are still typing or if you think of questions as we go, feel free to do those. Um, great, so we'll definitely talk about that. Um, what I will do now is that um, we talked about in the keynote, those sort of three layers of addressing trauma, preventing trauma, and then disrupting trauma. And so what I wanna do with our time together here is sort of look a little closer at each of those areas um, and I can offer you some resources to check out, some concepts, and also recognizing that this is a big topic. And so we'll, we'll only get so far, but I'm hoping to just give you a little further, further taste than we did in the keynote. Um, so where we're going to start is that sort of basic level of addressing the impacts of trauma. So in the keynote, I talked about this, right, that when kids experience trauma, they come into our classes, clubs, teams, um, and we wanna make sure that we're being responsive. Um, and so one of the frames that I like to use with educators to think about this is about sort of the big ideas that you can put into place proactively to make your classroom uh, or your team trauma-informed. And this is really going off of that, you know, I talked about or being informed by trauma. And so I really distilled these areas from having read and learned and uh, you know all of the various stuff about trauma, this is like my distillation of these areas. So the big concept that I want you to know about is this one called felt safety. So you probably hear a lot in education, right, about, oh, cl well, classroom should be safe. We should have a safe feeling team. Our school should be a safe place or whatever. Um, and it, something that's tricky about safety is that uh, everyone defines it really differently and we can't ever really say for somebody else what is safe for them, right? We can't define that for somebody else. And so I encourage people to think instead about this idea of felt safety, where instead of saying, hey, this is a safe classroom, you actually give cues to students that they are safe. Um, and it, this is basically going off the idea that when people experience trauma, their brain becomes really attuned to cues of safety and danger in the environment. And so um, when we give cues of safety, then people can actually feel safe. Um, so this is my framework for sort of how we build that, which is called the four proactive priorities. And I'll just say, you know, we'll go over these right now, but um, I dig into them a lot in my book if anyone's interested. And there's also a couple of articles online about my work where if you Google for, pri for priorities and my name, you'll find them. Um, so if you wanna dig deeper into that, you can. So what I wanna do is just tell you a little bit about each of them. And then I would love to hear from folks if there are ways that you foster these in your settings. And so what I'll do is I'll just tell you about the first one and then I'll open it up to the room and you can unmute and if you have ideas about these things. Um, so the first one, and also I'm seeing question, your questions in the chat and we'll get to them, thank you. So the first uh, priority here is predictability. And so this is really based off the idea that when you experience trauma, everything feels really unpredictable and trauma is sometimes uh, caused by experiencing unpredictability and unpredictability just basically makes us feel very unsafe and in addition a person who's experienced trauma you're very primed to kind of go into a survival mode right uh, to go into fight flight or freeze and that happens more frequently when the environment feels really unpredictable and so one way that we can proactively create trauma-informed environments is really creating a sense of predictability so people can feel safe because they know what's coming, they know what to expect, um, and there's less that's gonna really catch them off guard. Um, so a few of the ways that I usually encourage educators to look at these things, um, one is visual cues, so looking at the actual physical environment or online environment around you, what are those cues of um, what to expect, what's coming next, um, uh, how can I make sure that the space is feeling like, okay, um, I forget what we're doing. I don't know what's going on today. Okay, but it's on the board. Um, I don't remember how I'm supposed to, um, you know, like one example I, I think of is I was in a classroom where 
uh, the teacher put up these great sentence starters on the walls of how to disagree with your classmates. And it was really nice because the students could just refer up to them and it made the conversation feel more predictable, if that makes sense. Um, and then addressing sensory needs. So uh, something that increases a feeling of unpredictability is when your body has needs and you can't meet them and then it's like when am i going to get to when am i going to get to take a break when am i going to get to go to the bathroom when am i going to get to get water um and so just sometimes even those super basic things just going back to basics and making sure we're attending to those in a larger sense predictability also can look like really walking through things and i think a lot about you know if you all are going to competitions if you're traveling with students if you're going new places how are you helping to um, uh, you know, front load those, uh, go over some of the potential challenges that can come up, uh, go over maybe unexpected things that might happen. And so any of those things that you can do are ways to really just help foster that sense of safety. So let me pause and ask for folks to chime in uh, ways that you help foster predictability. So I'll hear maybe let's two or three people um, either in the chat or with your voice. And thank you for the reminder that we are recording, uh, just if that influences what you share. Um, and then once we hear from a couple of folks, then we'll go to the next one. So anyone have thoughts on how you help foster predictability uh, in your settings, either in the chat or with your voice? Hi, um, Becca Heyer. Um, I was just thinking about some of the things that I do when we travel to tournaments. Um, we do a travel sheet that the students get every Wednesday um, before we go, and it has the event that they're competing in, the time they need to report to the school, the time the bus leaves, the schedule for the entire tournament, where I will be, where the assistant will be. All of that is written down. Um, it has like, here's the things that you should bring to a tournament, right? Um, and we, when we transitioned to online um, last year, we still did those travel sheets and I think it helps the kids have a sense of normalcy in a very bizarre environment. I love that. Yeah, and that's just an example of how those really simple things can just make a huge difference. I also think about how you could even extend that and do something like on the back of the sheet, it says like, weird stuff that happens at tournaments sometimes you know and it's like uh, sometimes the wi-fi cuts out sometimes they mix up your reservation sometimes they don't actually have the food you request you know it, right. so if you are noticing that you have maybe particularly anxious kids on your team or kids who are maybe asking those types of questions frequently sometimes that's an effort to sort of gain that information so you can predict that a little bit if you can and write something up that's also a good mentoring activity, right, for uh, students who are graduating to maybe put something together for, for new students. Thank you, Becca. Other folks? Oh, wait, hold on. I missed the chat. Uh, we have other folks that also do the same thing. Oh, and in loop-in parents, that's a great one. Um, yes, and opening and closing rituals. As you all probably can tell, I love a good opening ritual, <laughs> so I'm always a big fan of that. Um, and yes, gauging the energy. So I think like little check-in things like I did with the Yoda or with the ducks, I also often will do like a rose and thorn or high and low check-in. And so people can kind of share what's going on within that day. And then the important thing that, uh, that G said is that that helps you gauge the energy. So you're able to um, take in what's going on and then be responsive to it. So oh, I heard that everybody is feeling really sleepy today. I was going to start with running through our arguments. Why don't we instead start with reviewing our research for, you know, 10 quiet moments, and then we're going to, you know, so just making those little flips are really helpful. I wanted to speak about the ritual idea. I have developed a ritual with my students, and if, I, if they think I'm forgetting about it, they will <laughs> let me know. Yes. Time. Love it that. all started with peppermints, you know, those soft peppermints. Um, and this is middle school kids, okay? I started giving them each a peppermint on the bus while we were on our way to the tournament. And I would hand it to each one and tell them they are mint 
for success. <laughs> I know, I know, it's corny, but they they would laugh, but then if I forgot about it, oh my, they'd remind <laughs> me. Well, it expanded. Then it became the peppermints because they're meant for success, and then it was starbursts because they're stars. And it further expanded, especially when we started adding debate to our, our um, list of um, competitive activities. Um, then it became Smarties in addition to the <laughs> because they are meant for success, they're stars, and they're really smart. And um, I'm convinced that it has powered us to some very serious wins in competition. <laughs> I, I love that, Leslie. And part of what I love about that, too, is that those are, you know, those are sensory cues also. And the brain maps experiences onto senses like taste and smell and sound really strongly, more strongly in a lot of ways than vision and reading and hearing. And so uh, having that like actual sensory experience of I'm tasting the mint. This mint reminds me that Leslie believes in me. So now I'm going to do it. You know, like that's just a great sensory cue. I love that. Yes, and snacks, so important. All right, let's, these are great. Let's move on to flexibility and then we'll do the same thing and get some ideas from folks. So um, flexibility, so you might be going, Alex, but wait, predictability and flexibility aren't those opposites. They really have to go together. So flexibility is important because how we respond to trauma is not linear. And like I mentioned before, uh, everyone's experience is different than everyone else's and as an individual person, you may respond to trauma differently on, a, on one day than on another. You know, one of my examples during the pandemic was, you know, when you're really stressed out during the stay at home orders, maybe one day you just wanted to sit there and watch Netflix all day. And another day you decided to clean your entire house and rearrange your furniture. Both of those are stress responses, right? Um, neither of them are bad or wrong. Both of them are valid. They just depend what you need that day. And so one way that we can really foster flexibility, and this is part of what we've already been talking about, is helping students notice what they need. Um, and this is, this is also just such a great academic skill too, right? If you're able to check in with yourself and say, you know, I'm feeling really anxious. What do I need based on that? or I'm feeling really hyped up and excited. What do I need based on that? Um, so really being able to notice what we need and then help students meet those needs. Um, also having a mindset of practice. So the idea that um, no one knows intuitively all the time how to respond to every single emotional state that you ever could have, or how to deal with every social situation ever, right? Um, and uh, sometimes people who experience trauma or are struggling with mental health can just be really hard on themselves when things don't go the right way. And I know that um, in your keynote yesterday, right, you talked about mistakes, you talked about failure. Um, and so that ties in really well to this too. So that idea that we're helping one another build that flexibility by just seeing things as practice, trying stuff out, um, learning from what we go through. Um, and then just offering people extra grace, extra patience, um, and, and recognizing that, you know, if you have an off day, it's not the end of the world, um, and we can all just be flexible. And that ties back into that idea I was mentioning earlier about, you know, when you're going through a hard time, what is it that helped you? And for a lot of people, it's just that grace and patience that other people offer to you. Um, so those are some of the elements of flexibility. I also, you know, when we talk about academics, I often will encourage people to think about flexible ways of, of meeting learning objectives. Um, and so that's an element of flexibility as well. So let me open it back up. Ideas from two or three folks in the chat or with your voice about uh, ways that you foster flexibility. Some of these ones people said about predictability also actually this one from Deborah is great about like uh, allowing that choice and encouragement about where do we want to stop and eat, you know, getting the input from the team. That's a great one. Other things that foster flexibility.
Um, so one thing I've tried really hard is to recognize that um, my students in my classroom and both on my team really have crazy, hectic schedules. So whenever they have to cancel on term, it's the last minute or this or that. I just, though I get frustrated, I try really hard to just like swallow and be like, yep, it's chill, man. Like I get that life happens. And I think that's earned me or made them feel a lot more relieved knowing that it's not the end of the world or that I'm not upset with them when life just happens. Mm, that's a great one. And, you know, obviously I'm assuming that all of you have very different school contexts and everything. I know that, you know, with my brother in our high school in, in Lexington, like uh, it, it wasn't just speech and debate. It was also like really intense college focus and really intense grades focus. And I would imagine that a lot of your students have similar pressures. So that's a great one of just, if you can be one of those people that is not on their back all the time, <laughs> that can mean quite a lot. Um, I'm seeing folks about letting students pick the subject, uh, letting, you know, having more flexible deadlines. Mm, students talk. Terry, would you mind saying more about what you put in the chat about what they need if they don't achieve their goals at the tournament? Sure. Um, not every student needs, the, as, as not all of us needs to be, um, needs to be supported in the same way. So we always talk a little bit on the bus if, you know, you're not able to do what you want today. Do you need to just be on your own for a few minutes? Do you want everybody to surround you and talk to you, you know, what do you need? And so we try to provide that in our rides. Mm. That, that's awesome. And it reminds me of um, sort of a class game you can play that's a little cheesy, but if your team is down for being cheesy, then you can try this. Um, it's called I Have News, and usually you're like in a circle, and someone's turn would say, um, uh, for example, I have news, and after I share it, I'd like you all to and then you say what reaction you want. So you could say, I have news and I'd like you all to clap. I have news and I'd like you all to go, that sucks. I have news and I'd like you all to say, woohoo. And, and then you share your news. So I might say, I have news and I'd like you all to clap. My news is that um, I beat my level in my video game this morning. So you know, it's nothing serious or whatever, um, or people can share more serious things. And it's like that little game of, of being able to ask for what you need and for everyone else to give you what you need. Um, and so I, that uh, practice, Terry, reminds me of that. Um, there's great stuff in the chat. I'm uh, scrolling back up so I don't miss anything. Okay, we had flexible deadlines. We have, ooh, I like this, posting the tournament schedule and then have students creating their own schedule within that. That's awesome. And that's such a great transferable skill, isn't it? Um, practice or meet virtually, even as we go back to face-to-face -face things, changing categories and reflecting on the tournaments. I love that. Yes, and helping them build up their own awareness. That's beautiful. All right, you're all crushing it. This is great. Um, <laughs> let's move on to connection. So this one um, maybe might feel more obvious, but uh, that connection piece when you experience trauma is so important. I talked in the keynote about the, all the different elements of why connection is so important. Um, connection is also something that people who go through trauma can struggle with. People can struggle to feel like they can trust others, feel like they can rely on others. And especially with school, um, a lot of times when youth experience trauma, they also experience that the institutions around them, like school, the legal system, medicine, um, their faith community, sometimes will let them down or make things worse, unfortunately. Um, and so school can be a place where they just will lose trust in, um, you know, the adults or want to check out of it. And so making sure that we really work on those connections and really show up for kids is really important. Um, and then also supporting them to uh, connect with each other and sort of get through some of those, uh, you know, social skills that may be challenging or um, conflicts that may come up. And so uh, making connections uh, home to school is helpful. I already heard that from you all a couple of times. Uh, those check-ins uh, day to day that we've already talked about and that human centricness that we also um, have mentioned already. Um, this also, I think, is a good time to pull in 
a question from the beginning about uh, bonding activities we can do with students. Um, I actually just wrote a blog post like yesterday about uh, beginning of the year get to know you activities. Um, and I will put that in the chat or if anybody has a tab open and goes to my website, my blog on my website and you wanna pull it, um, that would be awesome. Um, but really one of the things that I think about with sort of bonding activities, get to know you activities, is really helping students share just as much or as little as they want to um, and really honoring their self-determination, their privacy, um, letting them choose their vulnerability level. So like just as a small example, like when we did our little Yoda check-in at the start of this, you could just share a number, you could share a number and a reason. Um, if we were in a room together and going around in a circle, you could say pass. Um, so it can just be really simple little things like that. And then in terms of bonding, I often think about the content and the activity that you're doing together just lends itself to those experiences a lot of times, right? Um, those moments that you have while you're practicing, the times on the bus or in the van, you know, uh, traveling to and from places. Um, so I think sometimes, you know, I, I know for me as well, right? Like I often really want to have a bonding moment. We're going to play this game and then we're all going to be really close. It's going to be great. But sometimes just taking the long view um, and especially kids with trauma experiences can just take a very long time to build trust. And so just kind of letting that develop at its own pace, I think can be helpful. Um, all right, you're already sharing ideas, which I love. Um, and then I'm gonna open it back up. I'm just seeing uh, one here about, yeah, being able to practice through Zoom or one-on-one, -on -one. Um, parent meetings, that's great. Um, other things folks are doing or want to do to build connection. And thank you, Nicole, for posting the link to my blog, appreciate it. Yes, Google Forms, Google Docs, absolutely. Yeah, just that like space to say, I'm here and open if you wanna share anything, that's so important. Other pieces people do around connection. Have a Teams, a special Teams room for students and we do an electronic bus <laughs> and that helps them they can just talk about anything Any oh my stressors, anything i love that oh i love that so much that's awesome recreating the bus i love it yes virtual coaching yeah it's really just you know doing that doing that little bit extra to just figure out how do i connect with folks it's beautiful Other pieces folks do around connection. Um, because of the challenges posed by the virtual world um, and the inability of kids to be able to chill with each other or hotel rooms or whatever, uh, we established the Zoom zone. And so before rounds, after rounds, sometimes in the evenings until I threw them out because they were playing among us. Um, kids would, uh, come hang out in the uh, Zoom zone and uh, just kind of try to recreate as many of those in-person experiences as we could. I love that. All right, so let's do the last of these four priorities and that's empowerment. So by empowerment here, I'm not just talking about like feeling good about yourself or like you go girl, like that kind of empowerment. I'm talking about like having power and using your power. Um, agency would be another way to put this. So really the idea of, um, uh, you know, when people experience trauma, their power is often taken away from them. Um, they often feel powerless to change anything, to control the world around them. And often when you interact with systems after experiencing trauma, you can um, lose your sense of agency. So, you know, when you are kind of shuttled between different systems, when folks aren't listening to you, it can take away some of that agency and empowerment. And so being proactive with, sorry, I'm just gonna 
uh, mute folks because I'm getting a little background noise. Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, so fostering that empowerment can be really powerful um, uh, as a way to help people who've experienced trauma or who have not yet experienced trauma just build that like locus of control. So in empowerment, uh, we often look at fostering the ability to make your own choices, which a lot of you have already talked about, that way of giving people um, that, that choice in what they're doing, that power over that. Um, also encouraging people to scaffold vulnerability. So this, I just kind of mentioned this in the last section, but things like not requiring folks to uh, immediately share a lot of personal stuff, but really having power over their own story um, and telling that in ways that uh, make sense to them. Um, and then sort of fostering an environment of consent. So the idea that we're saying yes to things as opposed to feeling like we have to say no um, and really respecting one another's uh, view of that. Um, all right, already seeing some beautiful comments here. Uh, I I love I love that you know like some workshops and stuff I I do or conferences I present at people are very quiet and I am loving a, a speech and debate conference where you are all ready to go. Um, I'm loving this comment from John. John, do you want to say say more about that? I'm loving this idea about the inherent nature of uh, choice and control and debate. Not to put you on the spot yeah. if you're, if well, you're not going to speak. No, no, that, that's no problem. I've been coaching for many, many years. And even though there have been a couple experiments with respect to coaches' timeouts, uh, they failed miserably. Once the round begins, whatever instructions or directions you give a student with respect to what arguments to make, what evidence to use, once it begins, they're on their own. Unlike a lot of athletic events, there are no timeouts. And so students do inherently get to make their own choices about what they think will win the round for them and what not, what to uh, hold and what to hold, basically. So the nature of debate allows students a substantial amount of choice, no matter how directive the coach is. So the deal is, I guess, is that as students become more experienced in the activity, they become, they feel more empowered to make those choices both before the round and in the round, depending on how things work out. Um, I, I don't believe uh, in giving students, you know, total autonomy in terms of go ahead, choose your arguments. It's up to you. I believe they should. Uh, coaches should provide some direction, but absent that, once the competition begins, they are literally on their own. Mm. I, I love that, and I part of what I appreciate about that insight is that what's also I'm hearing is that it requires the coach to uh, to trust in the in the debater. Right, you have to sort of offer that trust and model what that looks like. Um, and the other thing that you made me think of was my memories of my brother doing debate and just that the, the students were really treated as competent adults almost in the competitions, right? There wasn't any sense of them being treated like kids, being treated like they, they didn't know what they were doing, but really this trust of this is a, you know, this is fun, but it's like a serious, it's a serious activity. It, it comes with a lot of weight. Um, and just really seeing that, I think, uh, goes a long way for that empowerment. Um, I want to catch up on this chat because I see a ton of great conversation happening. I'm seeing this idea from Gina about sort of having like the venting zone on the bus and then being able to reflect and think about what you want to change, but in allowing that space to feel what you feel. That's really beautiful. Um, and then... Justin, would you be willing to say more about your comment? There's a lot in there that looks awesome. Oh, yeah. So I, for reference, like I teach at a hyper competitive co college, you know, like this isn't brag. I'm fortunate to work here, but like the students are like competing to go to Harvard, Yale, these kinds of schools. So like that's the environment in which I meant everything from their entire lives, K through 12 is like be the best and they get the test scores and like, you know, you weren't one of the 45 kids that got a 36 on the ACT shit, you're a failure. So 
Um, I just structured my entire team to be a foil to all of that. Um, and so um, at the beginning of every year, all my varsity students fill out this form that it's confidential. It's between them and me. And it's like, please define success or what is your personal definition of success? And it's structured out a little bit. Like it, there's a big blank box because I like ambiguity, but then there's also a little bit more structured stuff, which is like, so why do you do speech debate? What is your motivation here? I, I use a lot of Simon Sinek start with why, like what is the purpose of you doing this? Um, and I get some interesting answers. There are a few all, every year that are like, I want to win. And I'm like, cool. Okay. I can work with that. But then I also get some that are like, my parents are like really domineering. And this gives me Fridays and Saturdays that I get to be away from that environment and, and whatnot. Or like, they won't let me go to parties. They'll let me go socialize at speech debate tournaments. I'm like, cool. You're in it for the social aspects. I was too when I was a kid. Awesome. Like, um, then others are most, the vast majority are just like, I'm in this because I suck at public speaking and I know that's an important skill or I really want to have some confidence in myself or whatever. It gives me like this huge barometer of things. My kids, especially my student leaders have bought into it as well of like, cool. So instead of like, here's our end of tournament, like results, this person got first place in oratory. Yay. We usually just like pull, put, I usually just put up a thing of like, here are students who made progress on their goal like and it's everyone usually and then like if there is like hey we won sweeps okay i'll put like hey team won sweeps congrats everybody or whatever um that's usually what i do um yeah i love that thanks so much and that's just a great way almost that you're doing all four of these things where you're being flexible about you know you're all doing the same activity but you've got different things going on you're doing that connection and building a community sense. It's empowering and it's very flexible. So that's awesome. And I'm seeing, you know, if you're willing, I'm seeing some requests in the chat for you to share your, uh, some resources on that. Yeah, I'll work on that. You guys are making me go into a Google drive. I haven't looked at in a month. <laughs> oh, damn it. But okay, I will. All right. Um, I'm looking at just one more great piece I'm seeing in the chat here from Michelle about uh, tapping into parents and community members uh, for getting some voice and perspective um, on a particular topic, which is really awesome. And I just appreciate, I appreciate that um, also as the connection to trauma, right? That if uh, the, the topic that you're doing in debate is going to uh, be connected to people's lived experience in your community, that empowering nature of being able to actually tap into folks who have that lived experience and honoring their voice. All right, this is awesome. Um, I want to move on from these four priorities, but just to sort of wrap them in a bow, I'll say that, you know, doing these four priorities is not the be all and end all of trauma informed practice. And like I said, you know, there's stuff in my book, there's tons of stuff online about trauma informed ed, there's things about you know, regulation and mindfulness and whatnot. Um, but to me, if you if you start with these four things, and if you make an effort that, um, you know, when you go into designing your, your class, when you go into making a resource, you just quickly say to yourself, is it predictable? Is it flexible? Does it foster empowerment? Does it foster connection? You're going to be a lot of the way there. And it's really creating that proactive environment. Um, so now I just want to briefly touch into these other two layers. We spent most of our time on that first one, which is awesome. And I want to leave a, a few moments for more discussion. Um, but I want to just talk briefly about these two areas as well. So the, that next level was about preventing trauma in school and competitions um, and in your teams. And this is where I talked about that trauma can happen within our schools. There's no magical force field. Um, and so paying attention to that. And so I had mentioned that um, I have folks answer this question of how is trauma present in my school, or you could say in my organization, on my team. And so I want to show you further these questions, which um, are in my book as well, if you want to have these. I also have them, um, I think I have these on my Instagram too, if you don't want to buy my book, but you should. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to think of, of where there's free stuff for you. Um, so these are some further questions that I have educators look at, and it's really illuminating when we dig into it. 
Um, and so if you have colleagues at your school, um, this can make a good exercise to just go through this. Um, and so I, I usually ask people to look at things like starting with the big picture, right? How does trauma in our society impact our school? So you can look at things like the pandemic, like um, uh, uh, police violence, uh, like gender violence, like, you know, all the different elements that are going on in society. There's no force field. And so those are showing up in school. And so to think about how is that impacting people? What is that looking like on a day to day basis in our particular setting? I also encourage folks to look at things like how historical and community trauma impact your town, your neighborhood, your school. So for example, I was talking to um, a school in DC recently, and we were looking at how is trauma present in our school, um, and their school is very close to the Capitol. And so we had a great conversation about, you know, how the January 6th was impacting their school. But then also we talked about, you know, their school's context in, um, in a city that uh, is very uh, segregated. Uh, uh, how does that impact how students experience school? And so kind of looking outside of the walls and thinking about, you know, what's going on and how might that impact what we're doing inside of the school. Then you can look at the different populations within the school. So remembering that we're breaking down the dichotomy and there's no, you know, population in the school that's exempt from trauma but looking at how are teachers holding trauma, how are leaders holding trauma, how are students. Um, another school I worked with, um, the student population was actually doing pretty well, but when I talked to the teachers, a lot of them were had a lot of very unresolved uh, challenges related to a former employee at the school who had done some really gross stuff and they had never really worked through it as a staff. And so the kids that were there had never known that teacher, um, but the staff were still really impacted by it. And so being a trauma-informed school for them really needed to, um, in part, be about processing that stuff. Yes, Deborah, that's another great example, right? Being close to where Flight 93 crashed, you know, any of those types of events, it's almost like there's, um, like there's ghosts of that that live on in the school. Um, and that may sound a little corny or something, but it really can impact how people interact and how people show up for each other. Um, because sometimes when we have that experience of trauma, new things that happen can bring it up, right? Um, if you are starting to feel anxious or unsafe, your mind can call up those memories, which then sort of exacerbates it. Um, and I would recommend there's a great, um, uh, organization called the School Center for uh, the School Crisis Renewal and Recovery. I'm trying to think if they're called like the School Center. I'm not getting the name right. I'll, I'll try to find it and put it in the chat at the end. The School Center for Crisis Recovery and Renewal, something like that. Um, and they do support for schools to sort of um, memorialize and commemorate different things that have happened. So that's a resource. Um, looking at how families and caregivers of students are experiencing trauma, um, that's another piece that can be really important. Um, I have a friend, colleague, Liz Kleinrock, who's a teacher and author of a book called Start Here, Start Now about anti-racist, anti-bias education. And she asked this question of her students' families to tell her about what was it like for you in the grade that we're teaching. Oh, here's my cat. Um, <laughs> Nicole, yes, thank you. That's the right organization. I appreciate that. Um, so for example, if Liz is teaching third grade, she'll ask her students' families, what was third grade like for you? And a lot of times she will hear that um, families have bad memories of school or they experienced trauma when they went to school or they still remember a harmful thing that that teacher said to them. And so it's an interesting conversation you could have with families about um, what was your experience in high school like? What was your experience with extracurriculars? Um, how are you thinking about these things? Because those can really impact how your students experience school as well. Then we get into what are some of the healing practices and coping strategies? So what are some of those strengths and assets that folks are bringing with them? Um, we often will focus, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> 
we often will focus a lot on deficits, but we also need to look at, she really doesn't want to be excluded. So here's Charlie. Say hi, Charlie. <laughs> um, we can focus on the deficits, but if we also look at the strengths and the healing practices, uh, then that can be really powerful. Um, so that could even look like understanding, you know, what are the different cultural groups, religious traditions in your community? How do they navigate through hard times? What does that mean for how your students are navigating through hard times? Um, and those things can be really powerful. So these are just questions that I would encourage you, you know, take these, use these, talk about them, because when we're looking at trauma-informed as being informed by trauma, um, understanding specifically, <laughs> oh my gosh, understanding specifically in your context, um, what does trauma look like in this school um, can help you understand a little bit how you want to approach it and what that starting point is going to be for you and your colleagues in your particular setting. Yes, and trauma comes in so many ways. I appreciate that um, comment, Deborah, and that goes back to that idea that trauma is that response that could be really different for everyone. And so we all can have different experiences and making space for those can be really powerful. <laughs> um, yes, school-wide healing. Um, all right, so I wanna end with, Sorry, I'm so distracted right now because my cat who never does this is like climbing all over me. Um, but here's my cat pictures so uh, you can understand my deep appreciation for her anyway. Um, so going back to this broad level of the things that cause trauma, this is where we talked about looking at how we address those larger systemic issues. Um, and like I said in the keynote, this is your bread and butter, right? As as debate coaches, this is something that you are already doing because you are really equipping your students to navigate tough issues, to understand different elements and sides of things. Um, and you know, one of <laughs> she, she keeps coming back. Um, one of the one of the um, pieces that I that I think about when I think about this as your bread and butter is also that there's nuance involved. And I know that, um, I, I don't know if at this conference or just other where, other places in this work, you all are thinking about this, um, but there's also elements within that, uh, that you're talking about these big issues, that it is really important to bring that trauma lens. Um, like someone mentioned earlier in the chat, right? How do the topics that you're looking at um, intersect with people's lived experiences? I'm sure that uh, in your field, you have talked before about the idea of, right, like what does it mean to talk about both sides of an issue when actually one of those sides is way more harmful than another, right? I know that, um, you know, I was talking to the folks at NSDA about how do we choose topics? How do we make sure that we're not falsely setting up both sides, things like that. Um, but these are just beautiful conversations that you can be having uh, with your teams and really thinking for yourself through that trauma lens of how do I make sure that we are um, not invalidating people's experiences, but really equipping them into that nuance and into that both and. So those are just some additional thoughts here um, for you on those layers um, and where you go from here with it. I, like I said, there's no checklist, there is no 10 point plan, um, but instead to really think about how you wanna make change in starting somewhere. And you know, I think sometimes when we think about change, especially in education, we think about, okay, we're gonna start making change and then it's gonna go up and, and things are just gonna keep improving on a you know straight up graph is, is increasing. But to me, change is much more like a, a spiral or like a blob. <laughs> so, so really thinking about, you know, we keep working on things, but the same issues might come back and come around and we just dig a little deeper each time. Or it's more like a blob where I do something and then the changes that result from it are not necessarily linear and not necessarily apparent, um, but they are making in, impacts in ways I don't necessarily see right away. So I really just encourage folks to embrace that um, messiness and lean into starting somewhere. 
So we have about 10 minutes left. And so I would love to uh, just open it back up for folks who have thoughts, wonderings, questions, things that we didn't cover that you were hoping we would cover. Um, so let, let's have at it. Any questions that came up either from this session or the keynote, I would love to hear. Or uh, resources, leads on resources, book recommendations are my love language, so I'm happy to <laughs> talk about some, some of those if anybody wants leads on anything. Um, I put a question in the chat. Um, I, over the years, there have been times when students, particularly in gender, um, discrimination or, or you know those sorts of situations have come to me and said we want this changed and I say yes that's a good idea and we actually have uh, uh, you know, some DEI folks in our school district now and relatively recently um, I went to the DEI folks and said hey you know could you set up some kind of a reconciliation meeting or something like that that we could do and the students who brought the concerns to me refused to participate in it because they were afraid that trying to address issues would actually make the issues worse. Mm. So that's such a common thing to happen uh, with student activism. And one of the things that I think about a lot, and uh, my friend and colleague, Christy Nold, um, who's a great, uh, you know, she partners with student activists in her school here in Vermont. One of the things she talks about a lot is that, um, there's a both and of helping students advocate for change and not making the kids be the leaders for change when actually it's the adults who should be doing stuff. Um, so, and this is tricky, right? Because often we go, oh, great, students, bring your stuff, we'll, we'll help you out. But then sometimes what schools do is put it on the students and say, oh, well, you want this change, you should talk about it, you should come to the school board, make a proposal, whatever. And the result is sometimes that the adults actually push the responsibility off to the kids when the kids, you know, even if the kids in question are 17, 18, they're still kids in a school, right? They don't have the power in that situation. And so it's one of those things where if they bring something specific, uh, we have to do as much as we possibly can to get the ball rolling. And if there's ways that they want to and feel empowered to help out, have their voices heard, that's great, but we should never wait for them to do it themselves. So it sounds like what you're doing is trying to help, you know, help the communication happen with the DEI folks and stuff. And so, you know, I think from your role, helping to be that bridge and to, you know, put the, put the fire under the butts of the people in the DEI office while also empowering your students, hey, there's any way I can help you have your voice heard. So just sort of being that navigator in the middle. Other folks with questions or unfinished thoughts, ideas, things you are thinking about? I just had a comment. Um, this summer, my... Oh, you got muted. I think I pressed the space bar. My district offered courageous conversations about race, and it was online, and I am... Um, black female and um, from the Caribbean. It was really difficult. Like at first it was super uncomfortable. Um, but I learned a lot about other people's perspectives. So I learned why, for instance, you, we can't just say, well, we're willing to handle it. Let's have a meeting about this because it's uncomfortable. And then it puts people on the spot for them to be both sort of I don't want to use the word victim, but for them to be both experiencing the trauma, but then also to fix the trauma. And so, and I learned why. So, I mean, I don't know, it was a long course and I complained loudly all the way through. So I was like, it's summertime. Why? <laughs> no. And I don't know. I'm visiting my mom. I think maybe like the child in me came out whining really strong, but I learned a lot from that. And I put, I put in the chat a link to a tiny little 
blog from their website about a Nike anti-racism video. They don't show the video, but and the 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 backlash that it sparked in Japan, and it could just let you know what those kids might have been up against if they spoke up. It's tough. It's tough sometimes. We have to create that atmosphere on a whole where maybe one or two people who are, we know what goes on. We know a lot of times we have the opportunity to know how students are, whether it's victimized, bullied, or traumatized, and we don't know how they react to it, but we know it can be happening. And we can sort of bring that up generally without singling out students or a particular incident. I, I don't know if that makes sense. It totally does. And I appreciate that. And it's that fine balance between inviting in the lived experience while not singling someone out and saying, hey, I think you have this lived experience. Why don't you display your trauma for all of us to see? Um, and uh, I'll quote again, I, I referenced her before. Elizabeth Dutro is a trauma-informed scholar. And she talks about the idea of um, for, for people to talk about trauma should be an invitation, but never a requirement. So the idea that it's always an invitation, so the idea that uh, your full story is welcome here, your full self is welcome here, but there's never a requirement that we're asking people to air out stuff uh, for the benefit of others, um, things like that. So I really appreciate that perspective and I, I support you in your, in your complaining because <laughs> Because uh, because it can be really hard to go through, you know, sit through PD or or for students, right, to sit through stuff where um, your learning needs aren't being met or you have a hard time with stuff. And sometimes I find it helpful, right? You get that little insight into, oh, this is how my students feel sometimes. So those are sometimes good exactly yes, it's good perspective <laughs> reminders. Actually, Alex, I would like some advice, and this isn't relating so much to what I do with my team, but in my classroom. Sure. Sometimes kids can be triggered by something without us knowing, you know, that it's a trigger for them or anything, because maybe they haven't shared. But then things come out, or they blurt out things, or they start to share things that are very personal, my concern is not everyone in the class is going to receive it in the way we would like them to. And my other concern is once they have blurted something out, are they going to regret it and then feel additional shame or whatever? You get what I'm saying. What yes. is the best way for, um, for that to be handled? Mm. So, I think one important thing to know is that uh, trigger, like trauma triggers, oftentimes people don't even know what their own trauma triggers are. And so I think you're spot on in saying that a student might uh, have a response that they didn't even plan to have, or they share something they didn't even plan to share. And so here's another place where that proactive stuff can come up of helping students have lots of options about if you feel yourself getting stressed, you can go, you know, take a break, walk in the hallway, or there's a spot in the classroom to take a break, helping students recognize their own emotions. So any like SEL stuff that you do to help students recognize when they are getting stressed uh, can be really powerful. And then I think also just cultivating some of your go-to phrases for how you want to address the class when things happen. And this is different for everybody, but for me, I sometimes will cultivate like a little like a, an almost lighthearted tone of like, whoa, this conversation just got real deep, real fast. I'm feeling like we all need just a quick break. Let's take a water break for five minutes and then we're gonna come back. Or, oh, okay, this sounds like we need to unpack it a lot more. I just wanna take a sec and have us all go back to our independent work for a minute. I'm gonna check in with a couple folks. So just figuring out like, what are those phrases you wanna have at the ready? and never being afraid to slow it down you know that that's in general my best teaching advice is slow down <laughs> and so creating space and creating some of those moments to just pull it back a little bit can be really helpful um we are at our time and so i want to just say thank you so much to everybody i want to apologize to the people on the video and in here who had to watch me deal with my cat during this whole time 
I'm amazed I kept talking through all that. Um, thank you so much for all of your beautiful ideas and um, resources for one another. That's awesome. And uh, stay in touch. Thanks so much, everybody.